morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Your response is in the bulletin. Welcome all who long to encounter Jesus, the one who loves, tends, sustains, and saves us. Welcome all who walk the halls of power, who feel pushed and pulled to fight for position, status, and authority. Welcome all who feel burned out, who have given more than they have day in and day out, and long for someone to notice that you too need help and support. Welcome followers of Christ who came to serve and show God's abundant love and grace among us. Would you stand with us if you're able and sing hymn number 660, God is Here.
Please be seated. Let us pray. Though you are God, with all the influence and status that the name implies, you refused to pull rank and parade your power amongst us. Instead, you chose to step down into our existence, living among us as one of us, with all the struggle and suffering that goes with being human. More than that, you adopt the role of servant, washing feet, serving people of no reputation or social standing, and giving of yourself completely. As incredible as it sounds, you are the God who serves, and we can respond in no other way than to give ourselves to you in praise. If you would, join with me in our prayer for illumination this morning. <clears throat> Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scripture is read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. This morning our gospel reading comes from the gospel of Mark found in the 10th chapter. I'll invite you to stand as you are able for our gospel reading this morning. Hear now these words. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they replied, We are able. And then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten had heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called all of them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them. And their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among yourselves must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be the first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, I'll invite our kids to come forward for our children's moments. Good morning. It's so good to see all of y'all down here. Can we do something this morning a little different? I'm going to invite you all to play a little game with me, if you will. All right. How about we, we're going to play a little game called Royal Court. Okay. So what all do you need to have a Royal Court? Can you think of something? You need to have a crown? Well, just in luck, because I have a whole bunch. What else do we need to have a royal court? Do we need to have someone to put the crowns on? Yes? All right, well, let's, let's do that today. So what all do we need? Who, what all types of people might be in our royal court? 
Anybody have any ideas? A king and a queen. All right. So should we should we pick somebody to be our king and queen this morning? No. No. <laughs> well, how are we going to have a king and queen? No ideas? Should, we, should I just pick somebody to be our king and queen? Okay. All right. Let's do that. All right. Asa, would you like to be our king? No? no? <laughs> well, Jacob, by default, you get to be our king. I'll give you your crown, and you can put your crown on. And Vivi, would you like to be our queen? Yes. All right. Ah, there we go. All right. Well, I need, hmm, maybe we need some, a princess for our, our court. Oh, we got lots of volunteers for princess. Well, we can have lots of princesses. That's one thing we can have. You know what I'm forgetting, though? There is one more thing that we need in our court. You think what I might be missing? A jester. A, a jester? <laughs> well, I was thinking if we have lots of kings and queens and princesses up here, we might need a servant. Somebody who might could, if we're thirsty, who could bring us some water. Or if we're hungry, might could bring us something to eat. Asa, would you be our servant? Yeah, you said that very enthusiastically. Yes. You know, not always, not always are we so ready and willing to want to be a servant, to, to serve other people. In our Bible lesson this morning, what we hear is that Jesus said that he came to be a servant of all. And so we think about Jesus, and I want you to think about our kings and queens and all of our different people who do you think God might love more in our court? Um, the king and the queen. You think God might love the king and the queen more? The servant. The servant more? What a... The princess. The princess, that's right. What about, do you think God might love everyone the same? Yeah, that's what it's like with God. That's what we hear is that Jesus, who came down from, from heaven to be with us and to teach us, that he said that he came to be a servant of all, to teach us that we might know how to live and know how to, to be in life. And so that's what I think I want us to take away today, is that God loves us all no matter who we are, whether we have a crown or not. You can have one too. You can try. You may have to tape that one up a little bit better. And so what I want us to hear today is that God loves every one of us equally, that, that there is nobody among us that God doesn't love. There is nobody who stands outside of God's love. So I hope that we can remember that, that that's the way we ought to live as well, that we ought to go out and we ought to love everybody just the same as God loves us. Can y'all pray with me this morning? Yes. All right, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you for your love that loves even me. God, be with us this day and help us to love. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. And y'all can go with Miss Claudia and maybe you can find some tape and make them a little bit smaller. You can keep them, yes. Okay, sorry. I invite you to turn in your hymnals to 436. The voice of God is calling.
If you would, please pray with me and for me. Loving God, we give thanks for this day in which you have spoken to us. God, in it might we listen. Lord, might we tune our ears unto you that we may hear what you have to say and, Lord, that we may take it to heart and go into this world around us to love as you have loved us. God, I pray that today as we come, that these words, that, Lord, they are yours and that the meditations of my heart and all of our hearts may be found pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We know that, sorry, got to move my crowns. We know that you can find just about anything online these days, anything that you could ever want and more. There was several years ago uh, an online platform that released and it was entitled Masterclass. And on Masterclass there was, um, you can now find any number of courses or classes that are taught by folks who are considered to be outstanding in their respective fields. For a monthly fee, you go on, you pay, and you get access to any number of lessons and wisdom from a whole host of folks on any number of topic that you can imagine. It all started several years ago when it released with three folks. It started with Serena Williams, who taught a course on tennis. Dustin Hoffman taught a course on acting. And James Patterson taught a course on writing. And since then, so much has been added from cooking to music to business and anything else. As we dive in today to the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel, what we find is that Jesus is in some ways offering to his disciples a master class on discipleship. He is giving advice to James and John and the others. When James and John come to him and they approach Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to give us whatever it is we ask. They are wanting something. They are wanting to take something away. They're wanting to be helped and find status and life. Just like many students who desire to learn tennis from Serena Williams or to play music from Reba McIntyre or to cook like Gordon Ramsay. And Jesus says, what is it that you would have me to do? What is it you want me to do for you? Because it's not clear if they want a lecture or a workshop or a demonstration. And they say, grant to us that we may sit one at your left and one at your right when you come into your glory. I want you to think about that for just a second. To think about the weight of what it is that James and John are asking of Jesus. Grant to us that we may sit one at your right and one at your left when you come into your glory. These two brothers want to be seen as the very greatest of the disciples. They seek that they may attain these places of privilege and honor, one at the right and one at the left of Jesus in the kingdom of God. And I can almost hear the sigh that Jesus must have given. We can envision Jesus shaking his head at these two as he says, you do not know what you're asking for. Because he knows that one does not simply rise to the top by simply asking for recognition. He knows that one does not simply rise to the top by watching an online video by someone who's considered to be the best. No more than anyone who takes a class on shooting a basketball can be the next Michael Jordan. 
Jesus knows that being a disciple takes work and dedication. It takes practice. It takes practice to shoot that basketball or cook that meal or sing that song or play that instrument or even to be a disciple. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They're being asked, can you accept the same kinds of suffering that Jesus now faces? Baptism, the cup, signs of suffering, not of worldly success. More on that in just a moment. But what Jesus is asking is, can you share in the same path to which I am walking towards the cross? And they reply, yes, we can. They reply, we are able. Now, while you have to admire the enthusiasm of James and John, their quick response to Jesus shows that they might be just a little bit naive in what they're talking about. They may not fully get, they, they don't understand what it is that Jesus is asking of them. And it's ironic to us as readers on this side of the story that James and John are asking for these places of honor. And immediately after Jesus has just told them of the humiliation and pain, the suffering and the death that awaits him in Jerusalem. Ever since Peter's confession back in chapter 8, when he asks, who are everybody saying that I am? And then he looks at the disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Messiah. And then things go off the rails. You remember the story and Jesus ends up saying, get behind me, Satan. Ever since Peter's confession of faith, Jesus has been trying to show his followers how being the Messiah, being who he says that he is, being who Peter has claimed that he is, might not mean what they think that it means. He's tried to get them to see this, but time and time and time again, as he has predicted his death and told them of the impending path before him, the disciples seem to experience some sort of, of cognitive dissonance separating themselves from the words that Jesus has just given them. His words don't match their understanding of reality. And we remember Peter rebukes Jesus for such statements. The response telling the disciples, Jesus responds by telling the disciples that they must lose their lives in order that they might find them. And that is just the first in a series of statements from Jesus over the ch several chapters in 8, 9, and 10 that, that, that don't really make a whole lot of sense. That leave us scratching our head wondering what in the world is Jesus even saying? And the disciples, they are afraid to ask Jesus to explain his second prediction in chapter 9. And Jesus further confounds them when he says, Whoever wants to be first must be very last and servant of all. And now for a third time in chapter 10, he explicitly states to them that he will be condemned and abused and killed in the verses just prior to what we read here this morning. And it seems that the disciples become less, under, uh, less able to understand the words of Jesus, the clearer and more direct that Jesus becomes. James and John completely ignore all of that stuff about torture and death and dying and suffering. Because what seems to be important, at least from the question in which they are asking, is as long as they can find the places of honor they seek, 
then everything else will work itself out. Because you see, since that pivotal moment of Peter's confession in chapter 8, Mark turns his attention not only towards Jerusalem, but towards this inevitable decision of can you follow Jesus so closely that you accept his fate as your own? Can you, are you willing to follow Jesus even to the point of losing it all for the sake of the gospel? For the sake of being a disciple? James and John are certainly willing to follow him into his glory. Yet Jesus repeatedly tries to tell them and to help them to understand that his glory depends upon complete submission unto the will of God. And that that glory might not look like what they think that it is. Because you see, a follower of Jesus cannot experience one without the other. What we've heard from chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 of Jesus is that rulers will become servants and that, 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 that leaders will become followers and that masters will become slaves. Whoever you are to become great, you have to become servant to achieve honor. You have to do so with humility. This truth remains this mystery to the disciples. And it's interesting to note that, that Mark, as, as James and John come to Jesus, they frame of how this is framed. The disciples' request comes in form of a statement. Jesus, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. But Jesus' response is in the form of a question. And when Jesus talks about his glory, he means the very core of his being, the very identity of who he is as the Son of God. Because while James and John have associated this place, this honor, with the throne of David and which they are hoping that Jesus will soon ascend to, Jesus knows and has told them they just weren't listening. But we can't blame them because how many times do we not listen? that it means suffering to the point of death. And ironically, these places that James and John are seeking at the left and the right in just a few chapters will be assumed by two thieves who were crucified alongside of Jesus. And Jesus tells The disciples, you don't know what you're asking for. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. And he raises up two very important images here for us, the cup and baptism. Both of which, as I said earlier, are symbols of of suffering, symbols for suffering. While they might conjure for us, images and ideas of the sacrament, James and John would have not interpreted cup and baptism the way that we do. James and John, they're wanting to share in the identity and the destiny of who Christ is as ruler and king. And as we've said, they don't grasp what this is going to cost them. They don't understand that the mission of Jesus was to come and to seek and save the lost and what that might truly mean. And when Jesus says, can you share from the same cup of which I drink and share in the baptism with which I am baptized, they assure him that they can. And Jesus assures them that they will. If you keep reading, according to Acts chapter 12, Herod would have James executed in just a few years, and John would suffer but survive. So claiming Christ's identity or glory inevitably leads to suffering. 
But I want you to hear that there's more to it than just the pain and the suffering. Because suffering as an end and of itself is not the point. It's not the point of Jesus' death. Jesus gets us to the real issue and to the real point in these words from Mark chapter 10. And it's all about submission to God. He tells James and John that this decision of, of who sits at, left and, uh, at the left and the right hand is not his to make. But only God has the authority for our place. And the kingdom is up to God and God alone. It's not for you or I to, discern, to determine who is in and who is out. I hope you heard that. It's not for us to decide, friends. That decision is above our pay, pay grade. Thanks be to God that it is. And we've got to talk about the other ten for just a second, right? can only imagine what was going through some of their heads when they heard everything that was going on. When they heard the audacity with which James and John approach Jesus and say, may we sit at your left and right in your glory? And here come the others who get a little indignant towards James and John. This is not righteous indignation, friends. This is downright jealousy. They were probably mad that they didn't think about it first. But they're all pretty sure and could probably make as good a case as James and John that they all deserved that place at the left and at the right. They've all worked just as hard, right? They've all walked just as many miles. They've listened to just as many sermons. They've given up everything in order that they may follow Jesus. So why should James and John get the good seats and not the other ten? And all of a sudden what we see is there is this jealousy that is threatening to divide the twelve amongst themselves. And I want you to look at what Jesus does. In the face of this division, he does not reprimand them. He does not call them to task and tell them to settle down and to behave. He doesn't tell them to grow up and start acting like mature disciples. He does this instead. He calls them over. And he begins to include them in the conversation. He knows what they want. He knows what they're saying. And he says, look, you all know that the heathen rulers lord it over their subjects, acting like tyrants, throwing their weight around, behaving like bullies and telling others that they don't matter. But Jesus says to his friends, that's not how the kingdom of God is. That isn't how you are going to behave, those of you who bear my name, if you really want to be associated with me. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be slave of all. Once again, we find this very odd paradox that Jesus gives us. That while human authority strives to dominate, the Son of God seeks to reign as servant of all. And those who bear the name of Jesus as well seek to serve the needs of others around us. That instead of trying to exert our power over someone else and tell someone else that they are not worthy or they are not as good as us for whatever make-believe reason we might conjure in our mind, Christ's power tells us that we earn, that we learn, or that we learn, excuse me, we, we find our place as we serve alongside of people. For the price tag of greatness in God's economy 
is servanthood. And you know, it's so easy for us today to look back and to think, my goodness, how thick-headed those disciples must have been that when Jesus told them the cost of discipleship, they wanted to fight and, 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 and bicker among themselves. But friends, how often do we fall in the same traps ourselves? We think we know what it means to follow Jesus. We think that we have cornered the market on what it means to be a disciple, to be the best disciple, to be the right disciples. But friends, what I hear Jesus say to us today is, as I said to the kids, it's all about how we treat others. It's about how we love it's about how we go forth in this world and offer ourselves with no agendas, with no ideas of, of, of I am better because of, but we come with a mentality that I am here because I love. And I love not because of who I am, but in spite of it. I love because God has seen through all of my faults and all of my flaws. And here's the good news, folks. God still loves us. We talk about this world that we live and that we want to see a difference, that we want to be the difference. And friends, I go back. It's got to start somewhere. It's got to start with us. So what would it look like if we left this place today ready to love? To not try to ascend to a position beyond ourselves, but to be the hands and feet offering the love of Christ to a broken and hurting world. Who knows, we might begin to see the difference when we can set ourselves and our own ego aside for just long enough that we might share the hope and the goodness of God Almighty. And maybe that would then be the only master class that you and I would ever need. For we pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Travis. Would you join me in singing hymn number 467, Trust and Obey.
as we gather today, we come and we enter into a time of prayer as we bring our needs, our joys, our hopes before the Lord of grace. We are so competitive, Lord. We want to know who will be best and first, and we hope that it is each one of us. You call us loved and special, and we interpret it to mean that we are the best. And we feel that we are entitled to all that is due to the best. God, today we come and I ask that you remind us that the best of us will be the servant, will be those who are willing to help and to witness to others of your love and grace made known in each of our lives, not for their own honor, but for God's honor and praise. For far too long, we have decided that we know what's best for the whole world, and we seek to try and run the whole show because we don't want to listen. You want us to bring peace, God, and to listen to others' wants and needs, yet we want to impose our will on everyone. We've gotten away from the call of discipleship to be your hands and feet. So, Lord, our prayer today is that you might bring us back, that you might shake the dust of arrogance from us and nourish us with humility and joy. Help us that we might be the kinds of disciples that serve you faithfully. That we might hear your call again this day. A call to life, a call to love, a call to serve. God, today as we gather, we come and we join our voices in the prayer that your Son, our Lord and Savior, taught to his disciples as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This morning as we continue our invitation to live into our stewardship, I invite Melissa to come forward as she brings our stewardship moment. I was trying to walk quietly during the prayer, but I wore flip-flops and that didn't really (laughs) work out. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Okay, so I'm going to start this off a little unorthodox, classic me, but I'm going to say three letters and I want you to repeat them after me. Okay, so I'll go, then you go. T, T, I'll go, then you go. T, 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 R, R. Great. With no context, we'll revisit that later. Okay. So um, when Rodney came to me and asked if um, I could share a stewardship moment, uh, the first thing I said is, um, yeah, sounds great. Send me an email. I have no clue when, what my life looks like. Okay. So as, um, it might come as a surprise to you, uh, being a mother, working two plus jobs and having four kids, time is a little insane. Right? Okay. Um, but that being said, um, on top of that, there's also Danny too, you know. So... <laughs> Um, But it makes me reflect back when I think about time to when I grew up. So I grew up in Richmond, Virginia with Bob Janice and my brother Joe. Um, And growing up, I went to two elementary schools, one middle school and one high school. And by the time I got to high school, I realized that I definitely wasn't a cool kid. (laughs) But let's just say I ate lunch in the chorus and drama room every day. (laughs) Um, And our tribe was small but mighty, right? And so my chorus teacher, Miss Matthews, gave her time. She would let us sit there and play on the piano. She would let us sit there and complain about life. (laughs) And her time was a gift, right? And then, you know, I think to 
growing up also, you know, every Saturday morning, mom and I on the way before I went to college, we would go to Panera and eat breakfast and go to yard sales to try to get cheap furniture. That was time. My dad and I would make up ridiculous stories about like the freckles on my face every night before bed. <laughs> that was time. And I fast forward to now when Addie and Allie and Josh and Jacob have had so much time from faces that I see out here at Vacation Bible School, building their memories. That was time given. Okay, so now I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, share your TTR. That was okay. Um, <laughs> okay, so let's flash back to uh, Virginia where I grew up, okay? So um, I grew up also in a Methodist church, St. Andrews United Methodist Church, and there was this lady named Miss Jessie, and she had a heart of gold. I think she was like 150 when I met her. I don't know, but she... <laughs> She's loved. Um, but she was just one of those people that had a heart of gold. She would do anything for you, but she never smiled. Like she was incredibly kind, but she never smiled. And so it kind of became a mission of my best friend Shannon and I that we're like, we're gonna make this lady smile. So um, it was one of the Sundays that the kids choir was singing and we were singing, you know, probably like Jesus Loves Me and some other song. And Shannon and I were like, no, we're gonna sing I'm Bringing Home a Baby Bumblebee, which has nothing to do with church, but you know, whatever. So we sang it, and of course, in true fashion, had all of our choreography with it. And at the end of the service, Miss Jessie came up to us laughing and hugged us. That was a direct example of how extreme talent in singing, I'm bringing home a baby bumblebee, can bring joy to someone. <laughs> so fast forwarding to today, sharing our talents with hopefully my, my skill in dance growing a little bit since then, <laughs> to dance up here with my daughters. Okay, but also to see the talents of Miss Jean and of Sheila and of Dr. Libby sharing their musical talents with our kids, they're saints. <laughs> and of Mary sharing her musical talents and the choir sharing their musical talents. Okay, those gifts every day bring us joy and every week. So now I want you to look at someone across the congregation and point to them. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> and say, Give your TTR. Give your TTR. You're doing great, awesome. Okay, last but not least, um, let's talk about giving, okay? So where I grew up, um, or when I grew up, my mom had a sewing room, and she had this big table, and underneath the table, I used to sit there and do who knows what, underneath the table while she did all of her arts and crafts and things that she does so well. And I had this little like tin that she would let me keep old buttons in. And I don't even know if they know this, but um, for about a month, every Sunday I would bring a button to church and put it in the offering plate. <laughs> um, fast forwarding 40 plus years now, I'm like, well, that doesn't really pay for an HVAC for the church, and it doesn't cover electrical issues, and it doesn't pay the salaries of the people who work here. <laughs> However, I've come to realize that, you know, we're gonna come into a lot of facets of our life. Sometimes we're gonna be able to give monetarily, Sometimes if the interest rates are terrible and we don't sell a lot of homes, we aren't going to be able to give a lot monetarily. <laughs> but, you know, we can also give from our other TTRs. We can give our time. We can give our talents. We can give other resources, the food bank, right, things like that, okay? So in closing, to say it for a fourth time, because if you say it four times, it's going to be imprinted in your brain, right? Okay, we're going to add a little choreography. So, T. 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 R. R. Great. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, please watch over us and help us sort out our time, our talents, and our resources, and help us to find a way to live those through you. Help our today's ceiling be tomorrow's floor to grow our time, our talents, and our resources. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite our ushers to come forward as we prepare to give of our morning's tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Loving God, you teach us humility and service. We bring our offerings today with grateful hearts. As we reflect on your holy scripture today, may we give as a testament to our commitment to serve others, not seeking the highest places, but embracing the path of sacrificial love. Bless these gifts and use them to advance your kingdom. Remind us that true greatness always comes through serving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing stanzas one and two. In the faith we sing, the number is 2130. The summons. Beloved, go this day in the blessing of Jesus Christ who challenges us to love through serving others, to receive love from the service of others, that together we may bind ourselves in community of those who bear the name of Jesus the Christ. So go in his holy name this day. Amen. <laughs> 